Let's start with the theory. As many of you know, I start with five simple assumptions about the international system. I'm a structural realist. I believe that the structure of the system, the way the international system is organized, its architecture, determines, not completely, but in large part, how states behave. Whether you're a Russian, whether you're Chinese, whether you're American, you just have to do certain things because we all operate in the same system. So this system has five characteristics. And you take those five characteristics and you put them together and you get certain forms of behavior. That's my story. So let me lay out the five characteristics or what I sometimes call the five assumptions. The first, which you all know about, is that the system is anarchic. Anarchic means there's no higher authority that sits above states. The opposite of anarchy is hierarchy. In English, anarchy sometimes means murder and mayhem, killing, wild and crazy, goings on. That's not what anarchy means here. Anarchy simply means that there's no higher authority in the system. In effect, the system is comprised of states that are like pool balls on a table. Some of those pool balls are bigger than the others, but nevertheless, they're all just pool balls with no higher authority. It's an anarchic system. The second assumption is that all states have some offensive military capability. Uh, this is not to say that all states have lots of offensive military capability, but the truth is a country like Guatemala, a country like Mongolia, a country like Thailand, a country like Belgium, it has some offensive military capability. But that's nothing compared to, say, the United States, Russia, France, Britain, Israel. These are countries that have a lot of military capability. But all states have some military capability. Okay, The third assumption, which is of enormous importance, has to do with intentions. Okay, Remember, the second assumption had to do with capabilities, and the third assumption has to do with intentions. And whenever you look at another state, what you always want to know is what are its capabilities and what are its intentions. So the third assumption has to do with intentions. And the assumption there is that you can never know for certain the intentions of another state. Now, why is that the case? It's because intentions are inside people's heads, and you can't see them, and you can't measure them. Capabilities are very different. Capabilities are material things. They're material entities that you can see, and you can count, and you can assess. Let me give you an example. When I was your age, the Cold War was going on. And I, being an American, spent a lot of time thinking about the Soviet Union. And we used to pay a lot of attention to Soviet capabilities and Soviet intentions. It was never difficult in an era of spy satellites to figure out what kind of capabilities the Soviets had. We could count how many armored division equivalents they had. We could count how many SS-18s they had. We knew how many MIRVs they had on their SS-18s. We could count how many aircraft carriers, how many attack submarines. It was never difficult to figure out what Soviet capabilities were in any meaningful way. Soviet intentions, we had huge debates, which continue to this day about whether the Soviet Union was a highly aggressive state, a status quo state, or what have you. Who knew what was in the head of Nikita Khrushchev? Who knew what was in the head of Brezhnev? Who knew had, who had his ear? Who knew who the three or four people were at the table with, who decided what Soviet foreign policy really was? We could never reach agreement. So there was always uncertainty about intentions. Now, there's some people say, John, you exaggerate. You can tell intentions of leaders today. You can listen to what they say. You can watch what they do, dot, dot, dot. I have all sorts of counter arguments to knock that down. But let's assume they're correct. My response to that is to say that even if you believe 
that you can know the intentions of states today. There's no way you can know the intentions of another state in the future because you don't even know who's going to be running China in the year 2020. Who's going to be running Russia in the year 2025? Who's going to be running the United States in 2030? In fact, if you think of it, one of you, one of you may be running this place 25 years from now. And who knows what your intentions will be? So you can never know future intentions. The best way to highlight this is to use an example that has nothing to do with international relations and has to do with the subject of marriage and divorce. Anytime two people get married, they inevitably think that the person that they're marrying is wonderful and that the two of them are going to live happily ever after. But as you know, in the Western world and in places like Russia, there's a very high level of divorce. That means a lot of people ended up marrying someone who they thought would have benign intentions towards them forever, but did not. It's very depressing to think about this. <laughs> but if you get married, the truth is you can never be absolutely certain that the person you're marrying will not turn out to be Attila the Hun. Really depressing, but you can never be certain. This gets at the essence of the problem of uncertainty about intentions. So I've given you three assumptions. One, the system is comprised of states and it's anarchic. Very simple. Second, all states have some offensive military capability, some more than others. Number three, you cannot be certain about the intentions of other states. I didn't say you could be certain that other states would have bad intentions. The starting assumption is you just can't be certain whether they'll be good or bad. Fourth and fifth assumptions are very simple. The fourth assumption is that the principal goal, not the only goal, the principal goal of states is survival. And the reason that survival is the principal goal is that if you don't survive, you can't pursue any of the other goals. Go read Hobbes's Leviathan. Right? Hobbes tells you the one thing everybody agrees on in the state of nature is that survival is the number one goal. Right? You got to survive because you can't pursue the other goals. Fifth assumption is that states are basically rational actors. They're strategic calculators. States are pretty good at figuring out what is the best way to maximize their prospects of survival in the system. Okay? Those are the five assumptions. You take them you put them in the blender, you hit the on switch, and you mix them up. You get three forms of behavior. The first form of behavior that you get is fear. States in this system fear each other. And they fear each other for two reasons. Two reasons. Number one is you may end up next door, living near a state that has a lot of power and malign intentions. It's like to say you may end up living next door to Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan. Right? It's one reason to be fearful. Level of fear varies from case to case, but a lot of fear in the system. Second reason that states fear each other is that if you get into trouble in international politics, there's no higher authority to call because it's an anarchic system. You know, in the United States, if you want to call the police in an emergency, you dial 911. 911. I like to say, if you dial 911 in international politics, you know who's at the other end? Nobody. There's nobody at the other end. Right? And in a system like that, there's a certain level of fear ingrained in every state. That's the first form of behavior, fear. Second form of behavior is self-help. You understand when you operate in an anarchic world that the best way to survive is to take care of yourself. It's a self-help world. As my mother used to say when I was a little boy, God helps those 
who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. Now whether you believe in God or not, the fact of the matter is, in the international system, given that it's anarchic, given that there's nobody at the other end when you dial 911, you better take care of yourself first. The third form of behavior, remember the first is fear, second is self-help. The third form of behavior in this anarchic system where you can never be certain that another state won't have a lot of power and won't put its gun sights on you is to maximize the amount of power that you have. You want to be very powerful. As I often say to American audiences, how many of you go to bed at night worrying about Mexico or Canada or Guatemala or Costa Rica attacking the United States? It's unthinkable. You want to know why? Because we are Godzilla. We are incredibly powerful. Nobody would dare attack us in the Western Hemisphere. It's the best situa situation you can have. You want to be really powerful. In an anarchic system where you can never be certain about the intentions of other states, and some states may end up having a lot of power, right? you want to make sure you have more power than they do. Why? Because you're offensively oriented? No, because it's the best way to survive in an anarchic system. That's the argument. Now the question becomes, what does it mean to be the most powerful state in the system? My argument is that it's impossible to be a global hegemon. The globe is just too big, the planet is just too big, and there's too much water. The best that you can do is to be a regional hegemon. You can dominate your region of the world, number one. But number two, you want to make sure that no other great power dominates its region of the world. Okay. Now, you may be asking yourself, why is it important that you not allow another country to dominate its region of the world? I'll give you a quick answer and then I'll explain. Because if another country dominates its region of the world, it's free to roam, free to roam into your backyard. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly is he talking about? I often say to American audiences, have you ever thought about why the United States is wandering all over the planet, sticking its nose in everybody's business, deploying military forces here, there, and everywhere? Have you ever thought about that? The reason is we are so secure in the Western Hemisphere. There are virtually no threats to the United States in the Western Hemisphere. There are no other great powers in the Western Hemisphere. That means we are free to roam around the planet because we don't have to worry about our backyard. To go to China, to get way ahead of myself, if China completely dominates Asia, it's free to roam. The United States wants a situation where China has to worry about its neighbors. Because if it has to worry about its neighbors, it has to concentrate on Asia. The United States did not want Imperial Germany or Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union to dominate Europe. Because then it would be free to roam into the Western Hemisphere, into our backyard. We wanted the Soviets to have to worry about Western Europe, to worry about NATO. We wanted Germany to have to worry about the Soviet Union, before that Russia, to worry about France, to worry about England, because then it's not free to roam. So the story I've told you is starting with those five assumptions, the ideal world for any great power is to be a regional hegemon, to dominate your area of the world, number one, and number two, make sure there is no other regional hegemon on the planet. In the Pentagon, they call this a peer competitor. You don't want a peer competitor. Okay? That's the basic theory 